Welcome, everyone, to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross. Taylor Fritz is a Masters 1000 champion. He's won Indian Wells, doing it in his home state, his home tournament, courts he grew up playing junior events on, uh, a court that he got his first ever top 10 win on. Semi-finalist last year, he goes all the way, and he ends Rafael Nadal's perfect season Nadal was 20 and 0 coming in. He almost made it to clay court season with an undefeated record. Fritz comes through in two sets. Lots to discuss about this one. Uh, Got to go over the injury stuff on both sides. That was uh, a talking point coming in, and it should be a talking point going out given how the match was contested. Uh, Fritz under pressure. The way Fritz returned in this match. Um, the Fritz backhand deserves a lot of love. I want to talk about that. And the Nadal week as a whole and the adjustments that were made slash not made in this match. So plenty of good stuff coming your way. A quick shout out to Play Your Court, the place to go if you are looking for a local coach, practice, partner, or match. The number one reason people stop playing tennis is because they can't find anyone to play with, and I don't want that to happen to you. So I've arranged a 15%, sorry, 5D, that is 5-0, 50% off uh, to join the Player Court community at playercourt.com backslash Gilgross. The link will be in the description. I don't want to begin with the injuries. The injuries, again, certainly part of what happened here, but the first part of the match where we had both players at a level that I think they could be proud of, they could be happy with, both, including Nadal, was the end of the second set. Thought it was exceptional stuff from 4-5 in the second forward, maybe even 4-all where Nadal's movement came alive. He started to defend and run really well. And at this point, Fritz, yes, was up a set, but Rafa was doing the same exact thing that he did against Sebastian Corda, uh, the same exact thing that he's done time and time again, which is under pressure, making the opponent earn everything. Fritz did it. And coming into the match, as some of you may have heard, if you watched the Nadal Alcaraz post-match analysis at the end, I gave a little prediction and I said I I would be concerned about Fritz's tendency to change the way he plays under pressure. When he's under immense pressure, he tends to get a little passive and he tends to decelerate. And it's very fatal for him because that's not what makes him a great player. What makes him a great player is that he can knock the cover off the ball. That he can absolutely crush it and play big man, aggressive, offensive tennis. That's what makes Fritz good. The problem is there have been times where he's been, he's got nervous and suddenly he doesn't even, he's not that guy. And then he becomes beatable. I was nervous about that coming in. He was 0-8 against the big three. Never thought that he put in particularly good efforts against them, including the loss to Novak Djokovic in Australia. Five sets when Novak had the oblique issue. Again, Fritz went into a shell there. He wasn't aggressive uh, against Novak in that match. 0-8 against members of the big three. 0-4 in his last four finals. He won his first ever final and had lost four straight. I had concerns. The Tsitsipas match going back to Melbourne. I thought he was the better player for most of that match. Not under pressure. At the end of every set, or at the end of three of the sets at least, the way he hit the ball changed. He decelerated. The miles per hour went down. The RPM went down. Stopped going after the ball. Didn't happen. It just didn't happen here. And that shows amazing growth. And it shows that the level of belief that Taylor has, has taken a step up. 
that he is confident in how he needs to play and that he knows that he needs to he needs to go for his shots regardless of the situation. I think he's always known that, but he actually had the strength to do it in this one. The whole tie break, he never decelerated. He never took his foot off the gas pedal. He never let fear or tension change the way he hit the ball. And in the last, from in the third set tie break, from 3-4 on, every single point, he hit a string of dictating ground strokes. On match point, he only had to hit one, serve plus one. Um, Nadal won one of the points with an amazing turnaround. Uh, Should have won two, missed a swing volley, missed a drive volley at 5-4. It would have given him double set point. Um, but Fritz Fritz played a, played great in this tiebreak. He really did. It was, it was awesome. So um, if this could have easily been a match where Nadal came all the way back and we, and we were talking about another miracle, Houdini looked down and out, somehow pulled it out. I think Nadal made enough balls and was moving well enough by the end of the second set where that was a real possibility. The match was by no means in the bag. However, going into the match, as I mentioned before, there were concerns about injury. Nadal had a uh, medical timeout in the third set against Alcaraz where he had his uh, left pectoral treated. It was, you know, just a quick thing. Um, and that was kind of, in, I'd say, in the back of the mind. And then just how physical and intense that match was. And at Indian Wells, you don't get a day off. There was definitely, I think, some reason for concern about Nadal's well-being. A little bit, but much more concern for Taylor Fritz. Tweaked his ankle at the very end of the match against Andre Rublev. And he even said afterwards that he was very worried about closing that match because he didn't want to keep playing on the ankle because it didn't feel well. But he was able to close it out very quickly after injuring his ankle. And that meant we didn't get to see much of Fritz and the ankle because I, I only think he played a couple of points after turning the ankle. Actually, I think he played a whole game, but uh, still not, not a lot. Then this morning he takes the court to warm up and seems to have some sort of incident where he aggravates the ankle and clutches it. And this is like five minutes into his training session and he leaves the court and it's all over social media. Plenty of people saw it. Uh, the, the ATP cameras, the world feed, they, uh, they're always running. So if Fritz, and I think Fritz was on center court, people are going to see that, you know, producers in the production booth and, and all that it's, and it, it got out. Um, so, you know, I was concerned that Fritz wasn't going to take the court and we weren't going to have a final. And then there wasn't going to be Monday match analysis, which would, would have been terrible. Uh, I'm just joking. It's not how selfishly I, I looked at the situation, but, uh, I was concerned that Fritz wasn't going to take the court. He takes the court. I'm thinking, okay, like he's in his, you know, this is Indian Wells. This is Fritz's favorite tournament. The one that means most to him. He might just be coming out here because he wants to show the crowd something and he doesn't want to disappoint them, but let's not expect too much. Then they start playing and I'm going to tell you exactly what I saw from both players. And then I want to talk about how injuries are should be covered by media and, and get into some other topics. All I'm going to do right now is describe exactly what I saw. My eyes. If I didn't know that there was an issue pre-match, I would not have noticed anything. Fritz ankle looked good. It looked fine. Everything looked normal. Now, Fritz is an awkward mover. If you have never seen him play before or if you are not too familiar with his game, you might have noticed that Fritz was moving awkwardly. Fritz just moves awkwardly. It's just how he moves. Uh, as to me, everything normal. Everything looked normal to me, and I thought Taylor was moving well. And I don't think I would have noticed 
anything wrong had I not come in with the prior knowledge that there was something wrong with his ankle because I just think he looked fine. Rafa clearly from the start ha was having issues serving. The miles per hour was way down and he wasn't, the motion wasn't explosive. At times it looked like it was kind of the, the peck. And then at times it seemed like he couldn't even push into it and he was actually having foot, more foot problems, which he's had earlier in the tournament. Serve was a mess. Then the movement, oh, are we back? Sorry about that, guys. Uh, then the the movement seemed to go pretty quickly. And, then, it, you know, it, it, for a lot of the set, it seemed, for a lot of the first set, it seemed like Nadal couldn't serve or move. Very, very, looked very off. He just did. He took a medical timeout. He took some tablets. They, uh, it was in between sets. They left the court. I don't know what the treatment was. I don't know if the tablets kicked in. I don't know if his body got warmed up or what it was. But I would say about two, three games into the second set, Nadal's movement started to come back. The serving never came back. Nadal's movement got much better even as the second set wore on to a point where I think he started to move at 100%. That's what I saw. Pre-match storylines, did I think that it was going to be Fritz who was the less compromised, the healthier player? Absolutely not. But that's what I saw. Nadal average serve speeds in this match. First serve, 110 miles per hour. Second serve, 93 miles per hour. Nadal had averaged 116 miles per hour on first serve throughout the tournament. So six miles per hour down. Then on second serve, I'm not sure what it was for Indian Wells, but we know we can go back to Australia, averaged over 100 miles per hour. So that's at least seven miles per hour down from what he normally does. And it was also the movement in the first set. So, um, again, you know, I don't think the first set, it, it was not something that I would want to really dig into because I thought Rafa was kind of a shell of himself from a health standpoint. And I thought Fritz was fine. I want to talk, though, about how injuries should be covered, how they should be approached. You know, my policy is to, again, always just describe what I see first, but uh, they must be acknowledged. And this is not about taking credit away from Taylor Fritz. This is not about this notion of making excuses for Nadal. They must be acknowledged. They are a reality. And they decide tennis matches. They do. Injuries are a part of the game. They have a constant effect on tennis. If you ignore them for the sake of giving someone credit, for the sake of holding someone accountable for a loss, no. You are only blinding yourself to reality if you are doing that. And I'm not doing my job if I'm not taking into account the effect that an injury can have on a match. I'm just not. Now, durability should be thought of as an attribute. Injury is not all about luck. Some players get injured more than others. I am will be the first person to say that I've been concerned about how much Sebastian Corda and Jensen Brooksby have been injured early in their careers. Their durability might be a challenge for them. And how much success... Will a player have in their career? Some of that is about durability. We know that durability has been a weakness of Rafael Nadal, especially on hard court. This has been a constant throughout his career. So if you're tired of injuries being brought up whenever Nadal loses, as it was against Lloyd Harris, as it was for me, 
against City Pass last year at the Australian Open, coming in with the back injury. As it was in in retrospect, far after the Roland Garros semifinal, which is a case where I re- where I reject it. I do not talk about injury when it comes to Djokovic's win over Nadal because I thought Nadal played great. And again, what is my policy? I say what I see. I care little about what the narratives are. Watching that match until the fourth set, Nadal looked absolutely fine, and Novak was up two sets to one. So that's that. But durability is an attribute. This is not a creation by the media. This is not giving Nadal excuses. This is the very simple reflection of a reality that Nadal's health gets in the way. A lot. It gets in the way of how successful he can be. It gets in the way of how much he can accomplish in his career. And that is why I also completely reject the sometimes used argument that Nadal should get a boost in his GOAT legacy, GOAT status, whatever, by the fact that had he been healthy, he could have done this and he could have done that. No, that's not how this works. Health is part of it. If you can stay healthy, that's an attribute. If you can't, that's also an attribute. This isn't luck. This is part of the game. Tactically speaking, the effect of Nadal's serve against Fritz's return was the biggest reason Taylor had an edge in this match. Fritz's return is extremely good against non-damaging serves. So, so, so good against non-damaging serves. What do I mean by that? He's not the most athletic returner. He is not someone who's going to take a great serve and hit an awesome stretch return back on the opposite baseline. He's not going to flex amazing returns back into the court. Not athletic enough to do that. So if you hit a really good serve, you're going to get rewarded for it against Taylor Fritz. He's not that kind of returner. Here's what he is. An amazing returner of second serves. But even on the first serve... If you miss your spot, if Fritz can get a solid contact on it, or if he's there, if you don't stretch him out, I think that's the best way I put it. If you don't stretch him out, he's going to make a ton of returns and he's going to make them well. He's just a fantastically clean striker of the tennis ball, and that includes the return of serve, and especially especially strong on the backhand side. Nadal losing the speed on his serve, that was a killer here because Fritz's returning, if you're not going to serve well, is uh, far, far, far above average. And what we saw here is Fritz completely neutralize Nadal's serve um, advantage to such an extent that Nadal only won points under four shots on his serve, 24 to 18. Again, you're obviously, you're supposed to dominate that category. You should win the vast majority of points under four shots on your serve. And if the returner is going to win points, more often than not, it should be because they were able to get into a rally and win a rally. Uh, But in the short points on your serve, you should You should dominate. Fritz won 31 to 15 in that category. Nadal only won 24 to 18. We can take a closer look. So we know that Nadal isn't going to get free points on his first serve. Slow conditions, Indian wells, down down over five miles per hour. We know that that he's not really going to get free points. But that is not always going to make or break this. What about that plus one ball that's so important for Rafael Nadal, that first forehand that is so strong? The numbers are this. On the plus one shot, the third shot on Nadal's serve, 
Nadal had eight finishes and seven unforced errors. So, okay. Basically a 50-50 ratio. How about the fourth shot from Fritz on Nadal's serve? So that's return, next ball. That's the fourth shot. Fritz had six finishes, two unforced errors. Fritz was better on the return plus one than Nadal was on the serve plus one. That is thorough and complete neutralization of a serve by Taylor Fritz. Both players made over 75% of their returns, but Fritz did much more damage on the serve plus one and the return plus one. That was the biggest issue for Nadal in this match. If you look at rallies, if we go back to rally length, uh, rallies over five plus shots, even. 33-33, dead tie. Four shots and under, 49-39 Fritz. That's the difference in the match. It was Nadal's serve versus Fritz's return, and the Fritz return one going away. Going away. And again, a lot of that is about Nadal's injuries. And if you, again, denying that based on even what the serve speed averages tell you and, and the peck and, and what we saw, uh, denying that is just putting a blindfold on, on reality. It's just how it is. Again, I, and I, I, I started, I want to I make this clear. The tennis scoring system makes it so that, I mean, again, Fritz could have played a poor end to the second set. Nadal was making plenty of balls, playing really good defense, moving well, running well. And if Fritz didn't execute, he would have lost the second set. We would have gone three, and who knows what happens. Um, so I'm not saying, I, I'm i not the guy taking credit away from Fritz, but there is no way if Nadal was able to serve his best, I don't think there's any way that Taylor Fritz could have smothered the Nadal serve as much as he did. Um, I do want to uh, now shift gears on kind of Fritz's offensive game and why that's so difficult for anyone, but including Nadal, to kind of get away from and and how he's able to stay on top of so many points. And again, the goal for Fritz is to not play from neutral because he doesn't want to defend. He doesn't want to have to rely on his lateral movement, which is not going to really be on par with a top with top 10 players. And by the way, he's kind of on his way to the top 10. So that's going to be the, those are going to be the players who we have to compare Taylor Fritz to. The reason Taylor is able to do that is largely because his backhand offensively is exceptional and one of the best on tour. And you look at the stats for this match, and it's really, really impressive. Fritz on his backhand, 14 finishes to four unforced errors off the ground. That is really rare. You see, you know, you see those numbers on a lot of forehands if on tour. Uh, I look at, you know, I'm looking at these stats all the time. That those are forehand numbers on the men's side. That's that's a forehand. That's not a backhand. Most backhands break even. Most of the best backhands stay solid. If you look at a Medvedev or Zverev or a Djokovic backhand, if you look at ground strokes, they're not going to hit a lot of ground stroke winners on the backhand. And these are the best backhands in the world. They're the best backhands in the world mainly because they stay solid for the most part. That is exceptional. That 14 to 4 on a uh, finishes to unforced errors ratio on the backhand. That's rare. Uh, Nadal was even. Nadal had 10 finishes, 10 unforced errors. So, and, and that's somewhat typical for a, for a backhand. Uh, you know, it's generally not a, a plus EV. Um, it's not a, a plus return on investment uh, shot. It's kind of a shield for a lot of players. And it's the path to the forehand. If you hit great backhands, you get you get opportunities to attack with the forehand. And Fritz's forehand, it's huge as well. And if you're curious about the numbers, I'll throw them out here. Um, 
20 finishes on the forehand and 14 on forced errors. I'm sorry. It's going to be 19. 19 finishes, 14 on forced errors. More efficient on the backhand. That's insane. That is really crazy. I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, that that is very rare. Fritz missed way more on the forehand, as you can see. Want to end on um, Nadal's week a little bit and kind of what I made of Nadal's tactics in this match. I was surprised. I thought after the first set, I thought we'd see Nadal with less than perfect movement and the compromise serve, I thought we'd see him go bigger and make Fritz play defense. And, and if if you're going to summarize, all in all, you know, why did Fritz look so good in this match? Why couldn't Nadal win? You have to make Fritz defend. You have to make him defend because if you don't make him defend, you're not attacking the area where he's vulnerable. If you're not making a move. Um, and Nadal did not make Fritz defend enough. Part, you know, one of the weapons is the serve. That's how you make a player defend. You make a good serve and you dictate behind it. Well, we just talked about how that wasn't happening. Because Fritz was dictating off his return just as much as Nadal was dictating off his serve. We just saw that. But how come Nadal wasn't going for broke a little bit more? I just never, th I didn't think he built up that confidence throughout the week. And the forehand never looked quite right to me. He, it never looked like it was in a place where Rafa was ready to let it take over a match for him. And that didn't happen again here. Uh, he didn't. He never went nuclear off the ground. He never went really big. And I that's the adjustment that I thought we'd see. Never saw it. But I wasn't shocked, given, again, how the week went. It was a bit of a struggle. He played really well against Carlos Alcaraz um, for a lot of patches. Besides the wind, which was going to make it very difficult on both players. The tennis wasn't going to be good. Uh, but in the third set, he, he found a way, played really well. In the first set, he did a lot of good things, too. But uh, we know that he it was a miracle that he didn't lose to Corda. Uh, we know that... Kyrgios had some chances, pushed it to three. We know that um, we know that Alcaraz had some chances as well. What was the deal this week after he looked so amazing in Acapulco? A level that was untouchable. I come into the tournament. I predict Nadal to win. I I say it's not just that because. You know, that's not atypical, but it was the most confident I've been picking Nadal in a hardcore tournament in a very long time. I don't know how long it's been. It's been a long time since I've been this confident. Then from the jump, just didn't look quite right. Was it the ball? Was it fatigue? Was it the foot? I don't know. I kind of drift towards the former. The first thing I said, I don't think he ever got really comfortable. Uh, this week in the conditions, which is not, again, it's not really an excuse because it's the same for everyone, but we know that some players feel better in certain settings. And I talked about before the tournament how I was kind of surprised that this hasn't been a great tournament for Nadal since 2013 when he won it. Well, the ball, interestingly enough, I did some research, it changed in 2015. They changed the pen balls and Nadal complained about it in 2015. In 2017, Nadal talked to Chris Fowler at the U.S. Open, and he talked about how much more confident he feels at the U.S. Open compared to Cincinnati because of the ball. Cincinnati uses a pen ball, and he's always felt like he has trouble controlling it. He's much more comfortable with the Wilson ball at the U.S. Open. That was in 2017. And then in 2019, he complained about the pen ball again in Montreal. So this has been something that has been brought up intermittently. And by the way, you can go back and find Federer and Murray also complaining about pen tennis balls. 
this has been something that's come up intermittently throughout Nadal's career with these pen tennis balls. Uh, none of the clay events use them, interestingly enough. None of them. Uh, most of the clay court seasons played with Dunlop. Most, if not all, it might be all. Um, so I don't know what it is, but it, it's not it's not a new thing. It's something that's been brought up in the past. I don't know if if that's it, but it just it looked like Nadal could play pretty well this week. You know, we know how mentally tough he is. We know how I thought his defense was pretty great throughout the week. He was moving pretty well. Uh, besides the momentary foot issues that he had at times, didn't really serve well, didn't hit his forehand well. So as a result, didn't think he had much offense here. And that's why he kind of went, at the end of the match, he kind of went into, into lockdown mode instead of going into offense mode. There wasn't really a moment. I thought there was one game where Nadal's forehand was good, and that was at, I believe, 4-5. Uh, yeah, 4-5, um, and there was a match point in this game for uh, for Fritz, and Nadal hit a great forehand on a first ball to save match point. Then he hit a service winner. Then he had a great forehand winner down the line. Uh, forehand was good in that game. That was kind of it. Other than that, the forehand was dormant. It wasn't missing all over the place really, but it was certainly, and it was missing too much, but it was dormant. And it, if I go back to those numbers, the ground stroke numbers, 13 finishes, 13 unforced errors, ooh, 50-50. Nadal wants to be much better than that on his forehand. And uh, I, I believe that was sort of an issue all week. Now I watched the match live against Dan Evans and I didn't think he really looked right. And I thought the balls were flying on him. And there were moments where everything looked fine. It was Nadal being Nadal. But then there were just times where the control would get away from him. Uh, especially on the forehand side. Which was uh, a little strange to see. So that's why I thought if if he was in a more confident place, I think he could have tried to rev up the aggression and make Fritz defend. But I will say one more time. One more time. What Nadal was doing would have been enough against a lot of guys. Trying to close out their first Masters 1000 event um, with Nadal doing the running and making the balls and putting the pressure that he was. A lot of guys would have folded. And Taylor Fritz did not. And, and you know, this is now a culmination, and I'm ending on this, a culmination of the work that Fritz has put in. He has been awesome since the fall. I said going into the Rublev match and after the Rublev match, that was 20 in the world versus 7 in the world. That's not a, ref a reflection of reality in my opinion. To me, Fritz is a borderline top 10 player right now. Before this week. He was a borderline top 10 player. Just by the way, he had been playing for the last five months. This was not out of nowhere. He has nine top 15 wins since last fall. Five of them here at Indian Wells. Nine. And he had every chance um, to beat Tsitsipas in Australia, which would, be, would give him a four-match win streak against top 20 opponents. He has been so good against top competition ever since last fall. So uh, well-deserved breakthrough for for Taylor. You take nothing away from him. And what a run from Rafael Nadal as well. So many memorable battles over the course of this 20-match win streak. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.